Welcome to this edition of Get Your Love On Radio. I'm your host, Julie Bueller. What a beautiful, blessed day we get to rejoice in. Thank you so much for being here. Our apologies for a few minute delay. And, uh, you know, thank you so much for joining us on the streaming apps and on Facebook and on technology, I guess is the way to put it, because uh, this is the most exciting thing we can talk about. This is today's message is the most wonderful news you'll ever hear in your life. We're discussing the resurrection, the greatest victory in mankind history by Jesus Christ in Nazareth. And we will celebrate that today through the word of God. So again, thank you so much for being here. It's a it's such a blessing and such a privilege to be able to bring this to you. Don't forget, you can always catch the show on Spotify, on SoundCloud, on Stitcher, and on, of course, on Apple iTunes. Let's re- get right into the word, though, because we've got a lot to cover. And um, I'll tell you again, there is nothing more exciting that you can possibly hear than what we are covering today. There's never been a more incredible victory than Christ's resurrection. Let's start in 1 Corinthians 15. This is the resurrection chapter of the Bible. It says in verse 1, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory that which I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. Okay, Paul's really laying it out here that this gospel is our lifeblood. As long as we choose it. And I I think it's interesting too. He says, unless ye have believed in vain. So there must be those that do believe in vain. Let's keep reading and find out who they might be. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I received. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And that he was buried. And that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And that he was seen of Cephas. Then of the twelve, after that, he was seen of about 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are falling asleep, fallen asleep. Well, I'm, I'm blessed to report to you all today that there are still those who remain unto this present, that know Christ, that walk with him, that have him inside them. And that is the exciting thing because of the victory he wrought. We have that testimony today. Verse 7, after that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. And last of all, he was seen of me also as one born out of due time. Well, my beloved brethren, if, if you're hearing this scripture for the first time and you're hearing of the great victory of Jesus Christ for the first time, know that you can be like Paul as one born out of due time. And we needn't look back into the past. We need only to move forward in the victory of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And we will give you the incredible instruction of God today in how to do that. It's so wonderful. Verse 9, For I am the least of the apostles, that am not meet to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. Again, whatever your past may be, the Lord has made provisions for each and every one of us to move into his great victory and to leave that past behind. So we'll do that. It says in verse 10, here's Paul's statement, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. And a lot of people could labor more to achieve what the Lord has for them in their life. They could. And that's what we're going to talk about today is how to labor in the Lord so that our labors are eternally rewarded. It says, therefore, whether it were I or they, so we preach and so ye believed. Here we go. Here's the resurrection now that Paul is pointing out and and laying out to these Corinthians. Verse 12. Now if Christ be be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith 
is also vain. If this, if Christ's resurrection is not fully understood, the faith that we have in Christ as Christians, the faith in God Almighty is also vain. Isn't that interesting? That's how important this resurrection is. That's how incredibly significant, eternally significant it is. It's the very key to our faith having substance. The Greek meaning of that word vain means empty, devoid of truth, containing nothing. It eradicates the substance of our vain. If Christ wasn't, if, if this resurrection power isn't, isn't his and isn't the gift he gave us as well. So this is very, very important. What a great point, Apostle Paul. Thank you for pointing that out. Let's go. Verse 15. It says, yay, and we are found false witnesses of God. Wow. It totally nullifies everything we stand for if Christ, if we don't understand this resurrection. Because we have, we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead raise rise not <laughs> for if the dead rise not then is not christ raised and if christ be not raised then your faith in, is vain ye are yet in your sins see the corinthians were in the middle of uh, uh some they had some people coming in there trying to pull their faith and 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 parse it out and convince them that the resurrection isn't real and there are, there are churches now that don't teach about this because this is very deep meat and, and they don't want to lose tithe payers. So they just skim over it. They don't give us the real meat and the real depth of understanding that Paul's laying out right here. And, and because of that, a lot of Christians faith doesn't have the victory in it, doesn't have that substance in it. Because if you, if we don't understand Christ's resurrection and that eternal victory that he achieved, then we can't walk in that same eternal victory that he's given to us. That's why this is so important. That's why Paul is so impassioned here in 1 Corinthians to, to outline the incredible departure that if we don't get this resurrection, our faith is in vain. There's no in between. There's no gray area. This is black and white. That's what Paul is outlining right here. And he'll get into it even more. So let's keep going. Here it says, Then they which are fallen asleep also, I'm sorry, Then they which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished, forever gone. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. That's right. That resurrection power, that understanding of our eternal habitation with Jesus Christ that we shall be raised up again is what gives us that incredible joy and that incredible peace. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. Now in the word, they, um, they explain, uh, David did it and does it in Psalms and apostle Paul's doing it right here. They're explaining those that die, not as those that die or perish, but as those that are sleeping, why? It's because of the resurrection. They're just in a, in a place of waiting. They're just asleep. They haven't been uh, fully sort of, they're not dead because there's eternal life for those that believe in this spiritual resurrection. There's eternal life. So all those that are sleeping, their body is asleep. And we'll hear in a little bit too how that body will be resurrected and transformed as well. So this is really neat. This is so incredible. It says, verse 21, for since by man came death, speaking of Adam, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Again, this great contrast of what it is to have a spiritual walk with the Lord, what it is to know eternal life versus death. 
But every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterward they that are Christ's at his coming. Then cometh the end, when, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom of God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Thank you for that incredible victory over death, over sin, sickness, and disease. Here we go, verse 27. For he hath put all things under his feet. When he saith, all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted, which did put all things under him. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. What a beautiful humility that, that Paul is laying out that Jesus Christ also is subject to God the Father as we all should be and as we all are that walk in Jesus Christ. Verse 29, else what shall they do which are baptized for the dead if the dead rise not at all? Why are they then baptized for the dead? And why we stand in je- and why stand we in jeopardy every hour? I protest by your rejoicing, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord. I die daily. Paul is speaking of the flesh, that natural mind that needs to die daily, that we mortify the deeds of the flesh in the spirit. When we walk in the spirit, in, in verse 32, if after the manner of men I have fought with beasts of Ephesus, what advantage is it me if the dead rise not? Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Well, a lot of people have this mentality, just the, the living in the moment, you only live once mentality. And uh, Paul is saying, well, why would I fight for Christ if that's the case? Why would that? That's not, that isn't... Um, a very wise thing to do if the dead rise not if we don't have hope in, inter- in eternal life if we don't have hope for the resurrection then what's the point but here paul said be not deceived evil communications corrupt good manners so these corinthians were having some evil communications some people that were trying to um nullify their faith by stripping the resurrection of the dead out of their uh, hope. But Paul is saying, can't allow that. That's going to corrupt good manners, those evil communications. So Paul says, this is 1 Corinthians 15, verse 34. And this is, this is our shout across this land as well. This is our, uh, our declaration here on Get Your Love On across the whole globe. Awake to righteousness and sin not. For some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. It's our job to speak about God Almighty and his eternal righteousness. That's our job. That's our privilege and our joy. So let's awake to righteousness, put off sin, sickness, and disease, walk in the spirit, and you shall not obey the lusts of the flesh, and start Start offering this knowledge of God, this pure knowledge that's found in the word. The King James Version of the Bible, that's what we read here on Get Your Love On. And it's for good reason. It's because it's it's the most pure translation. It was translated specifically to eliminate any bias, any agenda. It's just the word of God. And uh, it's beautiful. And so I'll say that again. Awake to righteousness and sin not. For some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. And then Paul says, But some man will say, How are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? Okay, see these people, they have a very natural mind. They can only understand this spiritually significant conversation in a natural way. So Paul says, Thou fool, that which thou sowest is not quickened, except it die. 
The word sowing is to plant the seed in the ground. In order to get anything to grow, you plant the seed in the ground, it breaks apart, and then it prospers. It's fed and it's it's watered and it prospers. And that's what Paul's talking about right here. And that which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body that shall be, but a bare grain. It may chance of wheat or of some other grain. But God giveth it a body as it hath pleased him, and to every seed his own body. Isn't that a wonderful example? How how Paul's explaining this? That one seed may look the same. But when you plant it in the ground, you allow it to break apart and start to prosper. And then it gives life. It springs forth. And no two plants are are exactly the same. Isn't that beautiful? And it's the same thing with our souls. God plants us. And then we have to go down. We'll, we'll, We'll discuss baptism and how that baptism is literally going down into that watery grave and coming up as a spiritual man. As a new body. It says in verse 38. But God giveth it a body as it has pleased him. And to every seed his own body. Isn't that wonderful how unique and special each one of us are in God's eyes? God's very personal. He's very individual. And that's proof right there. That God giveth it a body as it pleased him. That's so wonderful. Now here we go in verse 39. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another of fishes, and another of birds. There are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial. Celestial means heavenly, okay? Terrestrial means earthly. So again, Paul is creating quite the contrast here. And he points out in verse 40, but the glory of the celestial is one and the glory of the terrestrial is another so there again there's a real difference here that we are privy to through Paul's teaching there's a real there's a contrast so let's continue to find out more about the very um, the huge difference between these two bodies and what and the difference between a natural life and a spiritual life. There is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars. For one star differeth from another star in glory. Isn't that beautiful? Again, God is very individual. There's no cookie cutter approach to what the Lord's doing. Verse 42, so also is the resurrection of the dead. Ooh, all right. Paul's creating a really good logical sequence here. He's pointing out the very difference between a celestial and a terrestrial body. And then the glory, the beauty that is represented in each. And so is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. Couldn't be more different. The word corruption means decay, ruin, destroy, perish, to shrivel or wither, to spoil, defile. Wow. So the resurrection of the dead is sown in corruption. It's sown in ruin and destruction and and it's withering and shriveling. Okay. But blessed be God, it is raised in incorruption. The word incorruption means incorruptibility unending existence, genuineness, immortality, sincerity, undecaying, immortal. Wow. Again, huge contrast. Couldn't be more different. As far as from the East is from the West, corruption is from incorruption. Verse 43, it is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. Isn't this incredible? Paul is so clear here. He's so specific and so clear. 
and why churches don't teach this. The understanding of a spiritual body. The understanding of the difference between a natural mind and a spiritual mind. This is the very key to understanding the resurrection. Verse 45. And so it is written, the first Adam was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. This is Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the quickening spirit. In Romans 6, 3, it says, know ye not that so many of us were as were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death. That's what that baptism is. That's, that's why it's so critical. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. That is so incredible that that, that baptism into death allows us to then join Christ in his resurrection power. That's the key right here, my beloved friends. That's why we ministered on baptism, water baptism, the infilling of the Holy Spirit last week. If you missed that, please go back to the archives and check it out. Because And, and listen and tune your ear very carefully. Because to be baptized is the very key to understanding Christ's resurrection. There, this is Romans 6, verse 4. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. So let's walk in that newness of life by being obedient and getting baptized. It's so wonderful. Okay, let's get back to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We're in verse 46 now. It says, How be it? That was not first, which is spiritual, but that which is natural. And afterward, that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As is the earthy, such are they that are earthy. And as is the heavenly, such are they that also are heavenly. Okay, see this again, this massive contrast and the reason that the natural is first, the earthy is first, is because each of us get to choose what we want to take on. It's our choice. We're established in that earthy, corruptible seed. And it's our choice whether or not we want to be obedient, heed the instruction of the word, get baptized, filled with the Holy Spirit, and take on that spiritual, heavenly representation. And, and body and mindset. That's our choice. So God Almighty in his wisdom gave first the earthy and first um, laid that out and gave us the option and the choice to choose something much more. Every, every body will be sown in that earthy place if that's their choice. And if it's our choice, if we choose, we will also then be raised in incorruption. Again, there's nothing more exciting that anyone can tell you than this information right here. And it's, it's up to us. It says right here, And as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Isn't that beautiful? Thank you, Lord, for this incredible promise. 1 John 3, 2 says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Our eyes will be fully opened. 2 Corinthians three eighteen, but we of But we all, with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed 
into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Philippians 3.20 For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. This is a really important distinction here, my dear friends. This, the, the resurrection applies to us as well. And we must be part of it, actually. I'm, here's Paul in verse, 43, in verse 53. We're back in 1 Corinthians 15. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. The only way to have eternal life is to become incorruptible and immortal. And how do we do that? By being buried in baptism with Jesus Christ of Nazareth and walking in the Spirit. For when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality, what shall be brought to pass? Then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. It's the very key to walking in victory is understanding this resurrection that Jesus Christ of Nazareth rose from the dead, incorruptible, and gave us that same power. So when this, and then in verse 55, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of the sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Beloved friends, our victory is through the Lord Jesus Christ, his resurrection power, the fact that he was raised incorruptible. And that is our victory as well. When we walk in the spirit, when we love the Lord, and what does it say? If you love me, keep my commandments. When we are obedient to that word, then it's, it's incredible. And that victory is what we walk in every day. That same victory over death, that same victory over the grave, that's what we walk in. That's our day-to-day -day existence. Isn't that wonderful? You know, that's why it's beautiful to celebrate Easter. It's beautiful to recognize the, the power of the resurrection and that eternal victory. And it's also very important to note that we celebrate Easter every single day. Every breath we take, we do, we do so in that resurrection power, in that great victory of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Because thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So isn't that wonderful? Every breath we take is in that victory. It says, therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye stand fast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And remember how Paul pointed out how our faith would be in vain if we don't understand the resurrection, if we don't accept the resurrection of Jesus Christ of Nazareth and for our own selves as well, then is our faith in vain. But we know that our labor is not in vain in the Lord because we know we do accept the resurrection. We believe it with everything that's in us and we celebrate it this day and every day. Bless God. Thank you, Lord, so much. Here's a Psalm 16, verse 8. It says, I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. Therefore, my heart is glad and my glory rejoiceth. My flesh also shall rest in hope for thou wilt not leave my soul in hell neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures 
forevermore. That's the faith that we get to have as well. For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell. When Jesus Christ died on that cross and he was in the nether parts of the world, of the earth, and and in a, a compartment of hell, so to speak, he believed this and he knew that God Almighty, his father, would resurrect him. He knew that he, he had that hope as well. And that can be our hope as well in that we know that whatever the circumstances are, even in these trying times that we're in right now, that we get to hope in Jesus Christ of Nazareth and that incredible victory that Christ wrought in his resurrection and his faith right here. And we can have that too. That's our stance. That's our example. Psalms 49 verse 6, it, say, it says, They that trust in their wealth and boast themselves in the multitude of their riches, none of them can by any means redeem his brother, nor give to God a ransom for him. That's right. There's, there's no way to leave this life with anything. No, we, we've never seen a hearse with a U-Haul on it. It's because wealth and those that boast themselves in the multitude of the riches, they can't redeem a soul, that nor can they give God a ransom. No, they, nobody can buy their way into salvation. For the redemption of their soul is precious. This is Psalms 49, verse 8. And it ceaseth forever, that he should still live forever and not see corruption. So David knew this. David knew this. So it's it's a challenge to all the religious churches out there that don't teach the resurrection, that don't teach the resurrection of the dead. David was talking about it here too, that it was possible to not see corruption, to be incorruptible. Really important there. For he seeth that wise men die, likewise the fool and the brutish person perish and leave their wealth to others. Their inward thought is that their house shall continue forever and their dwelling places to all generations, they call their lands after their own names. Nevertheless, man being in honor abideth not. He is like the beasts that perish. So there, there is an ending to this life, this, this sort of natural existence, this earthy existence, of course. And everyone, when that happens, they people die. And, and that's, um, that's one part of the story. But here we have in verse 15, but God will redeem my soul from the power of the grave and he shall receive me. Selah. This, this is the story for a spirit filled Christian that accepts Jesus Christ of Nazareth and walks in victory. God will redeem my soul from the power of the grave. For he shall receive me. This is, again, a, a real contrast to the natural way people understand things, to the natural way of looking at this and what God has to say about it. That's why it's important to get a spiritual mind and to look at things the way God sees them, not to look at the way, look at things the way man or the natural mind sees it or the earthly mind. You know, again, when Paul... Paul was talking about there's an, a celestial body and a terrestrial body. Those are two very different things. So the more we seek God, the more we're in his word, the more we're reading it for ourselves and asking the Lord to show us things, the more we will become that spiritual man, the more we'll grow in the spirit. And that's what, that's what the Lord wants for all of us. In Job 19, this is incredible too. Again, these are these are the this is the Old Testament and what it had to say about God's ability to resurrect. And this was before Christ, and then Christ came and demonstrated it for us and gave us that same victory so that we too can say, "All right, that's for me. Yes, Lord, I want that victory. I want that in my life. And I want nothing less. Don't accept anything less. No, Christ was victorious. He resurrected. 
He, he was shown incorruptible. And we can have that too. In fact, we must have that. That's what Paul said. We, this corruptible must put on incorruption. We must have that. So certainly we can't accept anything less. So let's not. Let's make that determination in our own souls, each and every one of us, individually. Lord, I want all of you. Lord, show me how every day I want to get baptized, Lord. I want to do things your way. I want to get baptized. Show me how to do that. Lord, I want the Holy Spirit. I want to speak in tongues. I want all of you, God. Let's let's do that because we must. <laughs> we must put on incorruptible. We must. And that's that's um that's an incredible thing and and it's not, you know, it's not taught much in a lot of religious organizations. It's not taught very often in uh in a lot of places, it's not taught. This knowledge is, isn't very well known. And it's because a lot of, a lot of churches, um, they don't have the infilling of the Holy Spirit and they don't walk in that spiritual mindset. So they have a natural understanding of the word and of the scripture. And it says the letter killeth, but the spirit giveth life. So as we walk in the spirit, we will have life more abundant. And we will put on immortality. That's what the Lord gives us. That's his, that's his victory. Let's go to Job 19 verse 25. For I know that my Redeemer liveth. Isn't that beautiful? I know my Redeemer liveth. Yes, we get to say the same thing. I know my Redeemer liveth. Jesus Christ of Nazareth. We're celebrating his resurrection today. And every breath I take, we get to celebrate his resurrection. That's our gift from the Lord is to, to know that he lives and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. How is that possible? It's because of what Paul said. And we'll get to it here in First Thessalonians as well. It's because Paul said that corruptible, that body that's buried in the ground, that's just sleeping. That's why Paul says they're just sleeping. It shall be raised up and made incorruptible. So even though the, you know, the natural decomposition process happens to our natural body, God doesn't care. That, that doesn't stop God's resurrection power. Just like Christ's body was very badly uh, abused and, and tortured and mutilated before he was resurrected. When he was resurrected, what? that wasn't the case. He had the holes in his hands that Thomas could, could see, but that was a, merely so that the Lord could demonstrate that. But he was beautiful. He was shining. And that's our, that's our resurrection too. Our natural body will see God. Yet in my flesh shall I see God. That's what Job says. That's because that's the part of the resurrection as well. Here it says, verse 27, this is Job 19, whom I shall see for myself and mine eyes shall behold and not another, though my reins be consumed within me. See again, this is a, this is what Paul was saying. I show you a mystery because Job understood this as well. The Holy Spirit was revealing this to him. And Lord, I ask that through the Holy Spirit, you reveal these incredible mysteries to all those that are listening today. Isaiah 25 verse 8, it says, He will swallow up death in victory, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from off all faces, and the rebuke of his people shall he take away from off all the earth, for the Lord hath spoken it. And it shall be said in that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him and he will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. And that's today. Lord, thank you so much for swallowing up death in victory. And as we walk in the spirit, as we allow the Lord to mold us in his image, as we allow that corruption to, to pass and we seek more and more of that, those incorruptible treasures, then, then 
we'll see how the Lord wipes away tears from off our faces. And we, we don't, we don't even feel the rebuke of from off all the earth. We don't even feel that when we're walking in the spirit. It's such a beautiful thing. Hosea 13, 14. It says, I will ransom them from the power of the grave. Wow, that is incredible. This is Hosea's faith prophesying of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. I will ransom them from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. O death, I will be thy plagues. O grave, I will be thy destruction. I love how Christ flips the script on death. And everything that was laid out through the sin of Adam and Eve. Christ completely flips the script on it. Isn't that wonderful? I mean, that, that's enough to keep us walking and leaping and praising God all the days of our life. Death has no power over us. He has redeemed us from death. He gave himself as a ransom from the power of the grave. Let's go to 1 Thessalonians 4 now and um, get gain some more understanding of what this resurrection means for us personally, for us individually. 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 13, it says, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning, concerning them which are asleep. So again, those that have died in the flesh, Paul, Paul's calling them asleep. Because he knows that their bodies will be resurrected. That ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we, which are alive and remain, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. So this is speaking of when Christ comes and the rapture. So those that are dead in Christ shall rise first. That's that corruptible seed taking on incorruption. That's what Paul's talking about. So our spirit, when we pass away, when we die, goes to be with the Lord immediately. And then our, our body, it's resting. It's asleep in the ground. And then when that trump sounds, the dead in Christ shall rise first. And that corruptible seed takes on incorruption. Just like we saw with Christ. That's our example. And that's for us as well. And it says, wherefore comfort one another with these words. Well, yes, that's very comforting to know that we will be reconnected with all of our loved ones that have passed away, that are asleep in Christ. Hebrews 12 verse 1. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. That's the cloud that was being spoken of in 1 Thessalonians 4, where it says, Then we, which are alive and remain, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. Isn't that beautiful? Let's be part of that. Let's be part of that cloud that are there waiting, that cloud of witnesses. That's what we want to be a part of. Let us, in verse in uh, Hebrews 12, verse 1, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which, so, with, which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Yes, we certainly want that cloud of witnesses, and, and we can rest assured, too, if you're in a place where you've been a little bit sequestered off and a little, this quarantine is kind of getting very challenging, say, Lord, show me that cloud of witnesses that I get to be a part of. Lord, will you show me that? And he will. He will show you that because he loves us all so much. He wants us to know that we're not alone. We are a part of this great cloud of witnesses that, that know the Lord Jesus Christ, that recognize the incredible victory in his resurrection 
and that walk in that incredible victory in that. Uh, in Acts 1, this is what Christ is saying. Acts 1, it says, Christ is talking to, this is after he has been resurrected. This is what he tells the disciples. But ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all of Judea and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Well, bless God, that's happening today. And and there isn't a, a more wonderful thing that we can be witnesses of than the resurrection of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Verse 9, this is Acts 1, verse 9. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. Again, that cloud of witnesses, that's what we get to be part of. Isn't that beautiful? It is truly a wondrous thing, and um, it has nothing to do with candy or eggs or a bunny. <laughs> no, this is so much more grand than anything that's ever been commercialized. So let's stay focused on that. Let's, let's uh, help our neighbors know that, that uh, the Easter is actually a pagan holiday. It's not rooted and grounded in Christ's resurrection. And the more, the more um, anyone is leaning towards buying the little eggs and the candies and things like that, let's make sure we're reminding everyone we know about this incredible resurrection, that cloud of witnesses that Christ was caught up in after being seen of the disciples. But I'll tell you this again, religious churches don't know how to teach this. And that's, that's nothing new. They had a tough time in the book of Acts too. Let's go to Acts 17, verse 18. It says, Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered him. This is speaking of Apostle Paul. And some said, What will this babbler say? Other, other some, He seemeth to be a setter forth of strange gods, because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. When, when they only have a very limited, small, natural mind, that's what's going to happen. People are going to say, oh, that's, what are you babbling about? What are you babbling about? Or that sounds very, that sounds like a strange God. No, nope, it's not. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And in Acts 23, Paul actually um, was, was again facing these same sort of religi religious questions and people of a religious mind that just couldn't get it. Acts 23 verse 6. But when Paul perceived that the one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out in the council, Men and brethren, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee. Of the hope and resurrection of the dead, I am called into question. So even, even in the book of Acts, there were denominations, and the Sadducees didn't believe in a resurrection, and the Pharisees did, and these were all Jews. They were all part of the religious organization at the time. It says in verse 7, And when he had said so, there arose a dissension between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the multitude was divided. Hmm. For the Sadducees say there is no resurrection, neither angel nor spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. <laughs> and there arose a great cry, and the scribes that were of the Pharisees part arose and strove, saying, We find no evil in this man. But if a spirit or an angel hath spoken to him, let us not fight against God. And when there arose a great dissension, the chief captain, fearing lest Paul should have pulled, been pulled in pieces of them, commanded the soldiers to go down and to take him by force from among them and to bring him into the castle. The religious world always has their parameters, their little boxes to try to squeeze parts of the scriptures into. But God is much bigger than that. He's eternity big. And so that's why having any kind of religious precepts or religious indoctrination does not help in understanding Christ. In fact, if you want to know Christ, forget everything you've ever learned and just open your Bible and start reading. You can start reading in John and read through the Gospels. And, and the Lord himself will open these mysteries up. He does that. It's not through religion. 
It's not through form and ritual. It's through the, through the Holy Spirit. It's through Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And Paul saw that and he actually used it to his advantage because he recognized that they were part Sadducees and they didn't believe in the resurrection and part Pharisees and they did believe in the resurrection. And so he was actually able to escape out of that situation because of that division among them. Well, Christ is united. There shouldn't be any division in Christ. But here again, some Sadducees who, again, didn't believe in the resurrection. That's why they were so sad, you see. <laughs> that was a, a nice uh, way of remembering that that Brother Bob taught us some years ago. Let's go to Matthew 22, verse 23. This is really incredible, too, because, again, we're, we're dealing with a natural mind that doesn't quite, that not quite, it absolutely can't understand the resurrection because it, that is a spiritual matter. And so the same day came to him the Sadducees, which say there is no resurrection, and asked him. So these people that don't believe in a resurrection are going to ask him about marriage in the resurrection. And uh, we'll skip down to verse 28. And they ask, therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife shall be, she be? Because one man died and his brother at the time, the the um, next of kin would take on the wife. And so they're asking, whose wife is this going to be? Well, here's Christ's answer. This is awesome. Verse 29, Jesus answered and said unto them, ye do err, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. All right, let's make sure we know our scriptures and the power of God. It says, for in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. But as touching the resurrection of the dead, have ye not read that which was spoken unto you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. That's another reason that we must put on incorruption. We must, because God is the God of the living, not of the dead. So we can't have that death. Be a, there's, there's no room for that in our lives. God is the God of the living. It's very precious. It says, and when the multitude heard this, they were astonished at his doctrine. Isn't that wonderful? That's because they were looking at it from a natural mind. And Christ was giving them some spiritual revelation. All right, here's John 40. We'll leave you with this, and then we have an awesome message from uh, a wonderful minister of God. This is John 40. And this is the will of him that sent me, that every one which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Isn't that wonderful? That's Christ speaking, and that every one which seeth the Son and believeth on him and have that everlasting life. It's beautiful and it's the most incredible victory mankind has ever known. I have a very special um, song for you today too. And we're going to be enjoying a message here from our beloved uh, minister, Sister Trish. But this song, it's called, Was It a Morning Like This? And it's a beautiful song that illustrates the victory of Christ's resurrection. I wanted to play this for you and then we'll come back and, and get your soul fed even more by our beloved sister Trish. This is by Sandy Patty. It's called, Was It a Morning Like This? Here on Get Your Love on Radio. <laughs> 